on family camp, and that's March 25th through the 27th. Uh, and uh, that's Friday through Sunday morning. We, we have breakfast there Sunday morning, then we come back here for church. And so uh, it, it's just a wonderful sight and a wonderful place. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll release the kids to their own class. Let's pray for the kids. Father, we pray for Debbie and the rest of the staff over there as they teach our young ones. And they're so open to the gospel, Lord. And we just pray that they get it now and it'll last through their entire lives, that they'll remember their experience in Sunday school and in church and in camp. And Father, that it'll sustain them through this crazy world. Uh, bless Debbie and her, those that teach with her. In Jesus' name we pray. And Donna Lynn in the class that she teaches as well. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so family camp is coming up. Uh, Lucille, raise your hand, please. She'll collect money from you if you want to uh, put $50 or so down this morning. And uh, the, the deadline is the Sunday before the camp starts for the final payment, okay? So anyway, uh, Lucille's taking care of that today because Sharon is out of town. So Le Lucille's our other office person. Uh, in addition to, to our secretary, Lucille. Uh, Kathy Irvin's youngest son, James, we call him Baby James because he, you know, he used to be a little kid. But he's in the Air Force, and he'd been over in the Middle East, one of those little Arab countries, and the family was concerned about his well-being over there because, you know, that, that's a hot spot. Well, he's back home. He's back at Vandenberg Air Force Base, and so he's safely in the United States. So uh, Kathy wanted us to announce that, that baby James is home, to continue to pray for him and the military. Let's do that right now. Father, we pray for baby James. We thank you for that he's safely home. We pray that you keep he and the rest of his uh, companions uh, safe while they're here. And we ask that for our military in general, Lord. We, we're so grateful for them, and it's a voluntary armed services that we have. We pray for those men and women that you keep them, keep them safe. And Lord, keep them spiritually safe as well. Uh, allow the chaplains to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ and not take that away from them. That our, our military personnel might hear the gospel on a regular basis in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. I'm going to have communion this morning. And so I'm going to try to watch my time so we get out of here in a timely fashion so that I don't start rambling. Because I don't do that, you know. Anyway, uh, John's Gospel, New Testament, chapter 17. I don't know how many weeks we've been in this chapter, but... Perhaps we'll finish it today. The title of my message is Jesus Prays for All Believers. The beginning of this chapter, the first few verses says that Jesus prays for himself. And in that prayer, he's asking the Father to bring him back to the glory that he had before the world was formed with the Father in the heavenlies. You see, Jesus has always existed. He's, he's not a created being. In fact, he is the creator of all things. And so, in his high priestly prayer, that's what we call this, he's praying in the first part of it, Father, bring me back to that glory that I had with you before the foundation of the world. And that means back in the Father's presence at his right hand side. And so that's his prayer for himself. Then his prayer for his own disciples is the next section in this chapter. And for Peter and the guys, you know, that, that uh, he's going to leave them. But he's going to send the Holy Spirit back to live in their hearts. But he's also praying that the Father will keep them from the evil ones, or Satan as we know him. And so that prayer is in the middle part of the chapter. And then we pick up today in verse 20, where he says, pray for all believers. And so we'll read the first four verses aloud together, if you will. 
and then uh, I'll go back and start to talk about some other things in this chapter. And we'll go a couple other places in Scripture uh, to uh, bring it more clearly to the forefront. Father, we pray over the reading and study of your word now. We need your help always. This is your, your word of an infinite God to a finite people. And so we need your help to understand. Lord, your Bible is understandable. It's difficult at times, yes. But as we grow spiritually, we begin to understand better and more and more. It unfolds to us in the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord. And we're asking for that this morning as we read and study together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's read aloud together the 20th through the 24th verse. 23rd verse. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, uh, I have given them, that they may want be one just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. And I'll go ahead and read. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may ho behold my glory, which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. Jesus, again, in these chapters, starting in chapter 14, where he's announcing the fact that he's going to be leaving them, and he's going to be leaving them through the death on the cross and the burial, of course. And even after the resurrection, he's ascended into the heavenlies. And so they're not going to have him, the disciples, not going to have him in person any longer after, after the ascension. And so they're, they're, they're unhappy about that, those guys are. They're very dependent on his personal presence. But, oh, he's going to give them a greater thing than his personal presence, the presence of the Holy Spirit living in the heart of every believer. And so he's always there. He is in us. He is with us. And that's his prayer, and it's his prayer for unity. He wants us to be unified with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, of course. But he also wants us to be unified as a people. And that includes different denominations that will just lay aside all their denominational differences and elevate Jesus Christ and his saving work. And so we try to do that here. I do not pray for those, for these alone. He's, I'm reading verse 20 again, uh, referring back to Christ praying for the disciples. But also for those who will believe in me through their word. Now, if you want to, you can turn with me to 1 Peter near the end of the Bible. Turn to your right. 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read the majority of this chapter, actually 12 verses. Uh, because this is Peter talking, and he, he's talking to a group of people, he said, of the dispersion. And uh, I'll just explain it as we go. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, verse 1, chapter 1 of 1 Peter. To the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the knowledge of God, of God the Father, and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's interesting, in that one verse we see the Trinity clearly portrayed for us. The pilgrims of the dispersion, the the early church was being dispersed all over the known world. They were under persecution. Uh, the leadership of the Jews hated what they were saying. The Romans were afraid of them because they would not bow their knee to anybody else except Jesus. And so they were being dispersed, kicked out of their homes, kicked out of their synagogues. They were going all over the place. But it says that wherever they went, they spread the gospel. 
So God used an adversity in their life to spread the gospel. You see, they didn't have transportation like we, we have. The fastest form is probably a horse, and not many people had horses. And so they walked most places. So the pilgrims of the dispersion and, and all these countries mentioned here, Galatia, Pontus, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, are on that landmass that we look at as Turkey today on the maps. All those places were located there. So part of the dispersion went to Turkey and all those people groups in Turkey. He says, blessed, verse 3, be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now this is the elementary foundation of the gospel, what we mean by the gospel. Gospel means the good news. The good news is Jesus died on the cross. That would be bad news if he stayed dead in the grave, but he didn't. The good news is he was raised from the dead three days after his death, and he lives forevermore. It says he's in the heavenlies making intercession for us with the Father. He's begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Jesus is praying in John chapter 20 for the disciples of the original disciples as they spread the word. So we're reading about how Peter is talking about how they were spreading the word in that early time. But it comes on down to us through the centuries and it's the same word. It's the same gospel. It has not changed. Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. That the genuineness, verse 7, of your faith be much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory in the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him yet believe, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. It's an amazing thing uh, about us, since the disciples were here physically, how most of us have never seen Jesus. Most of us never will till we get to heaven. But we still believe that he is. It says in the book of Hebrews about God in general, it says we must believe that he is and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. You see, the, pro the problem with the world today, they have a problem believing in Jesus Christ, if they believe at all. A lot of people mix all kinds of religions together and say Jesus is just one of the prophets of all these great religions. It is not so, at least not what the Bible teaches. And Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come unto the Father except through me. So, you know, he eliminates anyone else. And I say this about our Christian belief system. Some people say, ah, you're too narrow-minded. You're, you're, you're not open to other, other thoughts and so on. You're, you're too narrow-minded. You're, you're too exclusive. You exclude everyone else. And that's half true. It's true in this sense that Jesus is the only way. So it's exclusive. It excludes all others, Buddha and all those other cats. But here's the beautiful thing about it. Jesus is the only way, but all can come to him. So it's, Christianity is inclusive as well. We can be included as we accept Jesus Christ. We're included in the family of God when we come to faith in Jesus Christ and his resurrection and the new birth that follows that. So we're both. Exclusive, Jesus is the only way. But inclusive in, you're welcome to come and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. He speaks about the various trials we go through as a refining process 
to determine whether the faith that we profess is true. You see, if we don't face adversity, we, we really don't know if we're really believing in the invisible God through Jesus. When we face adversity and we trust God in that, even though we can't see him, then that brings glory to him because it shows that mere human beings with our frailties, our failures, etc., can still believe in this God who we do not see on the basis of what the Bible teaches about him. You see, we can see him through the scriptures. We can see him in the ministry and life of Jesus and his disciples. We see God in them, and now we see God in each other as we walk by faith and as we walk a holy life. Walk means lifestyle, our lifestyle of holiness, of being separated from our own sinful ways and unto God in his ways to make us loving toward one another. And when we take communion, we're, we're going to talk more about that, the unity that he calls us. And communion just represents that. Now this salvation, Peter's still writing, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. See, this is future to Peter. He's talking about the future. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating that he testif when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. He's talking about the Old Testament prophets who were prophesying of his day, but beyond his day as well. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which have now been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven things which angels desire to look into. That's interesting. We can go back to, to John uh, chapter uh, 17 now. There's a song, and, and I need to find it because I mention it every once in a while. There's a song that has the lyrics that there's a song that angels cannot sing. It's a song of redemption, of being forgiven of our sins. You see, the holy angels never fell. They, they've never sinned, so they can't sing this song. But we can sing this song. No matter how cruddy we've been in the past, no, no matter how foul and nasty and awful we've been in jail or whatever, when we've been forgiven of our sins and God's cleaned us up by his Holy Spirit, we can sing that song of redemption. See, angels can't sing that. They don't have that privilege. We have that privilege. And it is a privilege when we, when we look at our own lives and what God has brought us out of and what he's keeping us out of today and helping us get over the bumps that are still in the road from our own sinful nature. It's amazing. It's amazing grace, like that song we sing. It's God's amazing grace. We don't deserve it, but he grants it to us as we open up and accept it. Amen. I do not pray for these alone, but verse 20, John 17, but for those who will believe in me through their word. And we read what Peter said about what happened through his and the disciples' word, where all those people had come to salvation. That they all may be one, that's unity. See, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, uh, that they may be one just as we are one. And in, uh, real quickly, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 18, uh, says this, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the, glo gl glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. That's what's happening to us now. We've been saved. We accepted Jesus as our Savior. We were born again. We, we underwent baptism to, ev to evidence that salvation. And now we belong to him. But we're spiritual babies when we first come to him, just like a natural baby. And we can't feed ourselves early on. We need somebody to feed us the Word of God. But it comes to the point when we begin to study the Word for ourselves, we begin to feed on the Word for ourselves. And it's tough at times, isn't it, early on? The Bible's two things. 
is a very difficult book. It is. It's tough. It's also very simple. Those little kids over there, those little scripture verses they memorize, they come to know Jesus when they're a very young age, and it's a real conversion. It really is. And some of these kids really comprehend some of the deeper things of the Spirit of God through the, the scriptures. Uh, some of you right here, you know that. Like, like uh, Gabriel's older son, Reuben, that kid is comprehending the Bible, man, I'm telling you. It's just a blessing when we see that in young people, especially the younger ones than the teenagers. It's a real miracle when teenagers come and stay with the Lord in these days, amen? So always good to see Zenon and his brother Frankie here with, with Dad. See, they're not teenagers any longer, but uh, they've been coming a long time. And so it's, it's encouraging to see that. We encourage you guys to keep on with the Lord. Man. So anyway, uh, we're being transformed into the same image. So as we study the Word, as we're in regular fellowship, it's really good that we're together. We can study at home. We can study on our own. We do a lot of that. I do a lot of that. But man, it's great to study together, uh, especially on Wednesdays and Friday nights now over in the fellowship hall. It's, it's more relaxed over there, and we can ask questions and talk about things. And so that's what we do on Wednesdays and Fridays at 630. It's cool. It's really new. And so, but here, this is all right, too. I love this. And uh, so, uh, anyway, we're being transformed from one glory to another. What's that mean? Well, see, we're to reflect as humans in all of our weaknesses. We are to reflect the goodness and the glory of God. We're, we're to learn to walk by faith and, and begin to develop the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, a gentleness, kindness, etc., self-control. That can be evident in our lives, but that comes as a matter of growth. It takes a while. And so we need to be patient with one another and ourselves as we grow in the Lord. We need to ask ourselves, am I growing? If you are growing, even if it's a little bit that you can determine uh, you're, you're growing. And uh, so you're reflecting one stage of glory to the next as you're reflecting more of Jesus Christ in your life. That's the glory that the world can see. And sometimes we're, the world's offended at us, isn't it? Uh, you, you, bub, you Bible thumpers, you know, you're always judging people. It's not true. I mean, if you came out of some backgrounds where they're always saying turn or burn and they, they wave the Bible in the street and all that stuff, you come out of that background, uh, then that's what you think Christianity is like, but it's not comes in different flavors and different expressions of Jesus Christ, but nevertheless, let, nevertheless, if it's the true Jesus of the Bible, then the truth can get through to their hearts. They can see it in us. And some of them can see it in us because they knew us before we came to Jesus. Some of us sitting here used to be alcoholics and druggies. We were in the world, and our old partners are amazed. You, you know, the guys at the railroad are still looking for me to fall. <laughs> it's been years since I got saved. But some of them are still looking because they know my past, you know, so. But praise God, that's past. That's behind. I'm beyond. And I'm not super spiritual. I'm not. I still struggle. But praise God, keep on keeping on with the Lord. Implementing 1 John 1, 9, that scripture right above here. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. Forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's pray and we'll go to the communion table and have communion. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this message, this time, this great gospel of John. And uh, so, so we pray that we have learned something today that's beneficial for our spiritual growth. In Jesus' name, amen.
thank whoever uncovered my communion cup for me. Because those of you that see me struggle with that, try to get that little film off, it's hard. So whoever did this, thank you. We're about to take communion. It comes from the original language Greek, from the word koinonia, which means togetherness. And communion, in a sense, we should see it is that it's not literally the blood and body of Jesus Christ, but it's what communion represents, that these elements are reminding us what Jesus did on the cross, how he sacrificed his own body, willingly went to the cross, even though in the Garden of Gethsemane he had a struggle with that in the flesh, if you remember that. But he said, not my will, but your will be done. He said that to the Father. And he went to the cross because he loved you and I. And so we celebrate his death, but also his resurrection at communion. Now churches do communion in different ways. Some churches have what's called a closed communion, whereby if you're not a member of that church, you can't take communion. But our position on that is, if you're a born-again Christian, if you have accept Jesus Christ in your heart, you're determined to walk by faith with him, then you're a member of the church. So you're a member of this church, today at least. And so you're invited to take communion with us as we celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So let's take our wafer. Oh, please, come forward and, and pick up your cups. Come on down. These Lord, little cups. Lord, help me come to, to the, the end, end of, of myself. Where all the light is left is you. Lord, help my heart and soul empty out. Fill me up, make me more like you. Sing over me. that song and uh, you know we have a lot of good communion songs are appropriate but this was written by a special friend of ours and she led worship at Costa Mesa Calvary Chapel for 10 years but she would bring young people to our sanctuary and she was training them to be singers and so on and they were outstanding talent if you remember that Kathy Gibson was her name and she's written over 400 Christian songs since she got saved, and she had been saved that many years comparatively. But God really anointed her and blessed her with that ability, and she played piano wonderfully, and she played by ear. She, 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 went, she didn't uh, sing by notes. She was amazing uh, how she could pick up the songs, and, uh, and she also played guitar. 
And then, then her daughter's a great singer. And, and so uh, Kathy was just a blessing. But she wrote this song late before she passed away. She passed away from cancer. But she fought the good fight for a lot of years with the cancer thing. She, she, she demonstrated the glory of God in her suffering because she was always smiling. She hurt, but she was smiling. And we were privileged to share communion with her in her hospital bed in Hogue Hospital in Newport Beach. And uh, she, she just never gave up on Jesus during all that stuff. And so she's with him now. She's rewarded. Anyway, so communion, koinonia. We're being brought together here. And, and uh, Paul the Apostle wrote these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you want to turn there, I'll give you a time to look it up. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you're in John, go to your right a few pages, and you'll find 1 Corinthians. And then I'll get back to it now. <laughs> Reading from verse 23. He says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he is betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And so with the elements, uh, let's take the wafer. I have to be careful because I spill this often. We take the wafer and it says... When he given thanks, you see, they were at the Last Supper or the Passover Supper, and it's called the Last Supper because the Jews today and many Christians celebrate the Passover, that festival that God ordained for the Jews. So that wasn't the last Passover dinner or meal, but was the last one that Jesus would experience with the disciples before his, his death, and that he'd be resurrected and ascended into heaven. So it's the last Passover until he comes back in glory. So uh, when he given thanks, verse 24, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And we'll pray over this before we take it. And if there's anything in us that we need to confess, I, I think we should do that. And, and I'll pray a prayer of confession, and you can just agree if you, if you want to. Father, as we begin to take this which represents his body, Jesus' body, Father, we know that we're weak and frail people, and uh, that, Lord, the, the flesh is weak. The, the human nature is subject to sin all the time. And so, Father, we confess our sins. We ask your forgiveness of them, and we, we trust that when we do it tr with true heart of confession and repentance, that, Father, you always forgive us. We know that it's not giving us license to sin, but you do forgive us if it's true repentance and true re confession. And so today, we confess our sins, Lord. We're asking that you cleanse us once again. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's take the wafer. As after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The new covenant, the new agreement between God and humankind was established uh, at the cross of Jesus Christ and sealed at his resurrection. 
So he says, for as often, and I love this verse, as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When we do this in memory of what he's done in the past, we're also looking to the future. That this ceremony that we're doing here is another way of saying he's coming again. He's coming to take us home. He said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am there you will be also. So Jesus is in the heavenlies right now playing, preparing a place for you and I. Someday we're going to get there like our friends that have passed on. And, uh, you know, I, I think Jesus stands up to greet them into heaven when they come home. I really believe that. So, anyways, the, the new covenant, new agreement between God and man. Something new occurred here. And uh, so we're going to uh, drink this cup together. Wow, I got through it without spilling it. Father, thank you for what this cup represents. We say the precious blood of Jesus because it was precious. The only human being that never sinned all of his life and willingly said no to sin all of his life. As Satan tempted him, the pinnacle of the temple and on the mountain, that the temptations of everything in the world would be his if he just bowed down to Satan. And Jesus just quoted scripture back to him, don't tempt the Lord your God. And so he went through that temptation, that face-to-face -face confrontation with Satan, the arch enemy of God. And he said no to him. At the very last, he kept saying no to him. Thank you that Jesus said no and went to the cross a perfect human being dying as an innocent person in place of us sinful uh, sinful people thank you Lord for that because because of that you see us as righteous in your sight we're so grateful for that thank you for this time together thank you in Jesus name we pray amen you please stand for this last song?